Hello, friends, and welcome back to Pod Return to the Waking Sands. Uh, we are a Final Fantasy XIV companion podcast where we explore the lore and story of Hydaelyn and beyond. My name is Jen, and I'm joined by my co-host and researcher. I'm Levi. Hello, Levi. Did you have fun doing Scholar for the first time, Jen? Yes and no. Uh, let me explain. So, uh, yes, the story was very cool. Um, I learned some, like, super secret knowledge. And uh, the no is because uh, as a level 90 summoner, I got a shit ton of skills and buttons on my on my HUD that I had no idea. So I had to spend like 20 minutes just reading through all of them, not knowing how they all fit together because I didn't have the benefit of starting from level one and gradually building up your rotation and your skill set. I had I looked at the whole fucking breadth of it. Just like with Dark Knight, it was completely overwhelming and I was totally unprepared for the battle instances. So, and that's frustrating because if I'm not immediately amazing at something, then I want to quit. So... That's that's because of the no, but that's not something I can work on. Understood. So we are talking about the scholar job quest through level 50 today, hence the preceding rant. <clears throat> Secondly, though, I know you began the job quest just a few hours ago, but in general, whenever I start a new class, I will, I've said this before, I'll say it again, I'm sure, go to Palace of the Dead, start at level one. And pull everything off your bar and put it on one by one as you level up in the palace and you gain those abilities in palace. Anyway, PSA out of the way. Let's talk about some scholar stuff. Yeah. In Final Fantasy in general, scholar has appeared intermittently throughout the entire series, starting with Final Fantasy 3. This job has had a fair number of implementations. It's not a healing class necessarily like white mages. It has been like an item class or a red mage-esque class before, job, whatever. But in 14, it is strictly a healer job. Scholar is what we call a barrier healer, meaning that in addition to actually recovering their allies' health, they also place shields on their allies, which will absorb a certain amount of damage. Consequently, this job excels if you are good at reading mechanics or you know a given fight well, so you can shield your allies in advance of a big hit. The signature mechanic, though, of the Scholar is the Fairy. You can pick between either Eos or Selene, the two different fairies, but it's purely cosmetic. Eos is like a sunny, light fairy, and Selene has more dark elements, some purples and so on. Mechanically speaking, both fairies do the exact same thing, which is they will follow you around and they will heal you and your party members that are injured. And this is really nice as you don't need to take the time off of your DPS rotation to top off your allies. The fairy will do it for you. However, you do need to intervene with your own heals when shit gets real. Are you serious? The only difference between two fairies is cosmetic? Yes. What the fuck? All right. Well, yay, another button I can remove. See, I like I don't I don't know. I don't know shit. I, <laughs> why would you give me two things if they do the exact same why would I want extra shit on my on my Like many things, this is a remnant from an older version of the job, and I understand the fairies did behave differently in past iterations of Scholar. Yeah, I was gonna say, like maybe one is like boosts your heals and one boosts your DPS. That's what I assume they did. In your defense, from a new player's perspective, why? Why give me Two buttons for one purpose. Clearly, they must do two different things. I would not blame uh, you for assuming that. But right. I wonder how many no. other people have two fairies thinking that they do other stuff. High five to those people. <laughs> for damage purposes, the Scholar has actually a decent variety of damage dealing tools for a healer. Besides the basic damage spell Ruin, they have Bio, which is a damage over time spell, and Ruin 2, which deals less damage than Ruin, However, it's an instant cast, so if you're dodging mechanics, you can still keep your uptime while running around. And finally, there's the basic AoE, Art of War, which just damages adjacent enemies. Side note, 
these are the level 50 names of these abilities. I know they change as you go up higher. Mm -hmm. The final big mechanic of the level 50 scholar is the Aether Flow ability. Every minute you can use Aether Flow, which charges up your Aether Bar with three little gems. You can use these charges to power various abilities that will supplement your main toolbox. These are Energy Drain, which damages enemies and heals you. Lustrate, which is an instant heal for an ally. And Sacred Soil. This makes a big bubble that reduces damage taken to any inside of it. So when you see a big bubble on the ground in group content, step in it. It's mm. good. I have a hard time telling the difference between the white mage bubble and the scholar bubble, but they're the... all good. So yeah, just if there's get, a bubble, get in them shits. Get in them shits. Um, I think the scholar bubble has like this hexagonal pattern that shines across it, whereas the the white mage bubble oil on water. It's 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 just different. Okay. It's just, yeah. It's hexagons just blue. or different. Now you know. Yep. You heard it here first. <laughs> in Eorzea, the scholar job originated in the kingdom of Nim. The Nimians occupied Vilbrand long before the Limsons came around, but the kingdom was lost around the end of the fifth astral era, during the calamity of water. Because this job quest deals heavily with Nim. We're going to feature that history right now in this episode. Some of this is described during the quest itself, but I'm going to hit it all at once just to not break it up and have to do it piecemeal. The Kingdom of Nim was primarily made up of Lalafels that migrated to Vilbrand in longboats. Nim was smaller and less powerful than the other city-states of that era, but they took full advantage of their location and their naval prowess to become a commercial powerhouse. For military defense, Nim made use of marauders under the banner of the Royal Marines. Supported by scholars, these marines could fend off incursions from much more powerful city-states, in particular Vok and its void scent. So Nim held their own for a time against the other powers until tragedy struck from a seemingly random occurrence. Some shipwrecked sailors ended up on an island with a tribe of native Lalafels, who helped them to recover their injuries and to rebuild their ship. On departure, these Lalafels gave the sailors an ornate amphora as a parting gift. However, this meeting was no coincidence, but was a plot orchestrated by the Vaki to take down Nim. The amphora contained a curse, and it unleashed a terrible sickness onto Nim. This disease would cause the Nimians to become disfigured. Their extremities either contracted or melted away entirely, their flesh turned green. In short, they transformed into creatures that looked much like the Tonberries of legend. The infected Tonberries were ultimately sealed away in a place known as the Wanderer's Palace, immersed in floodwaters summoned by Nim's Magi to make sure none would escape and to infect the remaining populace. This event was not the death blow for Nim, but it was a mortal injury. They were already depleted in number by the time that the calamity struck, and they were ultimately forced to evacuate with aid from their newly formed grand company, the Maelstrom. And we talked about the Maelstrom and so on during the grand company episode, so if you haven't checked that out, do so. It's good, hopefully. (laughs) We'll learn a bit more as we progress through the quest, but those are the main beats of the Nimian history. And finally, a preemptive gripe before we get going. The scholar job is as scholarly as Indiana Jones is during the movies. It's a little bit dissonant for me to be running around called a scholar when the gameplay is all action. We don't read one thing during this quest. It's actually, ironically, the marauder that does all the reading while we do all the fighting. Pretty much. That's all. Alrighty, so Muriel at the Arcanist Guild lets us know that there is a... A uh, very well-read uh, marauder, hilariously enough, looking for a very skilled arcanist to help him with some archaeological research that he's doing. That's us. 
yes. She's like, I, you know, as as weird as that sounds, uh, I think maybe this might be a really fun opportunity. So off we go to the Marauders Guild and we meet up with Alka Zolka. And uh, he is a Lala Marauder, bespectacled and a little blonde ponytail. And he lets us know what he is all about. Right away, he mentioned something about blah, 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 stratagems. And I'm like, fuck. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, this is an- great. Harkening back to our favorite quest line, yeah. the Arcanist. <laughs> so he's researching military tactics of Nim. I'm like, okay, that's that's new. That's cool. The society flourished 1,500 years ago during the Fifth Astral Era. During that time, you know, the use of magic was fucking everywhere. But then, of course, it got to a point where it devolved into the War of the Magi. And like Levi mentioned earlier, the Nimians were uniquely positioned, despite their numbers, to fend off some pretty heavy armies. Um, And he's trying to figure out, why is that? What was it about their their format, their tactics, um, whatever, that allowed them to, to, to be this successful? To get these materials, these relics, these engravings, these ancient texts, uh, he spent a butt ton of money. And on his way to Limza to get to the Arcanist Guild, he was intercepted and all of his shit got stolen. I think that he ordered it and it got stolen on the way from the transport. So either way, the shit was intercepted and it was stolen. So now we have to go retrieve it. And he's pretty sure the thieves are holing up in Raincatcher Gully at the ferry docks, which is probably a good place to get things coming and going. So off we go. This is a very fun solo instance. Every single solo fight in this duty is a lot of fun. I mean, it went from zero to 100 like right away. Normally, you don't get a uh, an instanced uh, conflict right out of the gate. Um, you might be sent to go like fight an animal or two, you know. Um, but no, we're, we're thrown right into the midst of probably like 10 um, quote-unquote broken soldiers. And these are, you know, they're, they're lancers, they're taumaturges, they're pugilists, they're... But what's interesting here about this fight, though, is that it's not just, okay, so let's fight five guys. This is a kind of a roving battle. Yeah. Because you will be pushing through the enemy lines as you start on the far side of the covered bridge that goes over the creek that runs through a raincatcher gully. And then you'll be fighting through the guys over the bridge, down the stairs to the ferry docks, and then finally on the ferry itself as you're making your way towards these stolen goods. So it feels a lot more dynamic than here's a carved off box of land. Right, stand where you fight. here while hordes of dudes run up to you. Yeah. So this, yeah, this felt very cinematic, honestly, like um, like an Errol Flynn movie. Everything here is feels very creative and. It must have been the quest designer that took these extra pains because this job was added at the start of A Realm Reborn. This isn't like a rogue ninja situation where it came in later on. So whoever worked on these job quests really seemed to have taken it up a notch. So we fight our way down to the ferry docks, and then once the thieves are defeated, we recover the tablets, which is a treatise on Nimian military tactics. And we find something too. While Alka's busy making sure its goods are safe, we see a job crystal in the crate, and we we pick it up. There's a surge of energy, and a luminescent fairy springs into existence. Yeah, so, okay, so the, the, this, this fairy appears, which nobody expected, least of all Alka. He has this look on his face when, when she first appears that is just hilarious. He's just peering over his, his tome or his uh, tablet, whatever it is. And he's, he's kind of like squinting like, the fuck? And then she just like, bloop, and he's like, what? And then he starts reading, uh, The sunlight of Eos doth soothe and shield. The moonlight of Selene doth silence and strengthen. Lies. This is why I thought those <laughs> buttons did two different things. Motherfucker. Fair. Elka is like, holy shit, we have rediscovered the long lost magical arts of nimian scholars fuck when he reads that phrase the fairy goes from her tinkerbell look into the Celine form which is the dark fairy version when we say dark it's like instead of white her legs are pink (laughs) yeah (laughs) darker yeah 
She's not like the void scent version of Eos. And then we get a weird echo-like vision where the fairy calls our name before things flash back to normal. Yeah. Weird. Weird. But yeah, like the, the fairy stone is the stone of the scholar. Yeah. It's like, you know, every other job stone it has, it contains all the memories of probably the fairies. This is a bit different though, because normal job stones have the memories of the past practitioners in there. And we get to unlock more by acting like those people did. But for the scholar stone, though, the fairy is somehow tied up in unlocking the stone's memories. We can't act bookish and we don't act bookish. So good thing. But we we can't just be all smart and stuff and have the stone give us its memories. The fairy is the one who needs to remember things for us to learn from the stone. So it's kind of like a weird tripartite where it's us and the stone and the fairy all linked together here. Yeah. Anyway, we go back to the guild to collect ourselves, and Alka entrusts us with the stone because we are the magic expert. He couldn't use it anyway, so we get to be the one that bears the crystal. Cool. So he goes off to study the tablets for a while, and then we return, and he has found out more about scholars on these tablets. Evidently, One scholar would be used to support an entire party of marauders, keeping the whole unit healthy and strong. Interesting. Also, the scholar would be the leader and tactician of these units. Ooh. There were signs, though, that these scholars knew more spells than us, so what's up with that? Alka thinks that if we can unlock more of the fairy's memories, we can then learn more from the stone. So he suggests that we go out to Outer Lanosia where the ruins of Nim are, and survey the area to hopefully jog the fairies' memories. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. As like, much hey, as anything. Hey, remember this engraved monolith? Does that do anything for you? No? Ah, let's try this other one. How about this engraved monolith? Eh? Eh? No? Shit. Okay. We do that four times. So we head to Outer Lanosia. This is the area where there are these floating rock islands with these stalactites of blue and orange crystals underneath. And the whole area is dotted with bleached white Nimian ruins. We rock around as Jin described, and we check them out. And eventually, though, we end up at a vista. It's this cliff overlooking this big misty valley, and the air above is scattered with these earthen islands. It's especially distinct at night because all the crystals are lit up and you can see the light against the dark background. Mm -hmm. Something along the way has done it for our fairy, as when we get back, we have learned the sucker ability, which is a group heal and shield. Nice. Also, that whole exercise let us know that every fairy is a unique individual with their own unique um, pasts, uh, you know, cache of experiences, memories. So uh, that's kind of cool. They're not just like like a mammoth or something. I think uh, mammoths start the same and yeah, then become unique. Yeah, then they unique. eventually become, yeah, yeah, it's a bad it's example. pretty rude there, Jen. <sighs> Any, well, you know what I mean. They're not like rocks. <laughs> but it's not like everybody goes to the fairy store and picks one up and they're all the same. So while we're trying to deal with this new set of skills and whatever. Alka has been furiously studying the um, Nimian marauder techniques. And when you go visit him again, he's like, oh my god, I read about all this stuff and you wouldn't believe and blah, 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 blah. And he goes on and on and on. And then he's like, what? okay, I'm, I'm rambling. But basically, what I'm saying is Nimian marauders and scholars fought side by side, right? Well, today, we are going to do just that. Because at Bronze Lake, they uh, sighted a Tonberry wandering around, um, menacing the populace, as they are want to do, I suppose. And the Marauder's Guild has been tasked to deal with it. So off we go. Alka also reminds us that the Wanderer's Palace was unearthed, unwatered, I don't know, <laughs> in the wake of the Calamity. And so the Tonberries who were once sealed away within can now escape and menace the countryside. These Tomberries, theorizes Alka, could be the ones that were sealed away in the time of Nim. So maybe upon seeing these guys, it will jog some fairy memories too. Yeah, let's go Let's go do the things. We're going to unlock some memories and we're going to fight. Huzzah. So we get there and it's, it's us and it is Alka. That's it. 
Yeah. Um, we're going to deal with this, the two of us. And uh, in short order, we see a Tonberry at the top of some stairs and we uh, charge him. This well, Tonberry is very unusual. It, it, his name is Peculiar Tonberry. Um, he is also bespectacled. Uh, he has a mortarboard cap on. He very much looks like a, a you know, like a Hogwarts professor, which is unique. The um, mortarboard, though, is octagonal. I didn't notice that because ours ours is different. Ours actually has like a little like a curve and a da, 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 da. This is the same are, are you talking about like a stop sign type octagonal or it's, it's got the curves but it's still it's more like an, like an arabesque. Okay. Or like is it, it looks a little almost like Moroccan the, that, that shape. Right? Yes, correct. Okay. I mean, yeah, we're talking about the same thing then. Yes, but it's not a. It's not a like a four sided like collegiate grad cap or whatever. Eight sided arabesque collegiate grad cap. <laughs> there we go. So when we, we see this guy, do we see him? He's He says something, but then he's all of a sudden like consumed by what looks like he says, void sin cloud. He says, my son, my dear son, at long last. That's son with a U, mm-hmm. by the way, not an O. And then it becomes a wash in dark energy. Yes. It seems to be incited to violence by this cloud of malevolence. Yeah. He's basically hulking out. And then we get our second solo duty. Which is a pretty spicy encounter. I had to do this three times because again, I had a, I had literally like twenty buttons that I didn't need on my thing, and before I could do anything, I had to mouse over it. Like, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? I mean, I have like a rough organization. Like, you know, DPS shit goes over there, AOEs go over here, dots go over here, um, shields go. You know, like I have a general. I think most most people kind of set up their shit. I just hit the mic. Set up the shit. Uh, you know, in, in similar ways across all of their jobs to try to maintain some sense of yeah mental organization. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I, again, and I've fallen into this trap so many times before. I'm a fucking idiot where I just, I, I stopped uh, killing the ads and the ads killed Alka <laughs> over and over and over again. And then I would get so, he would get so low on health and I'd be just like desperately trying to heal him. But I, I think I had like two... Two me like yeah. like straight up heal spells at this so point. You have a heal, and then you have a shield ability, which right. also heals less. But in terms of overall health, you will gain it's more C- correct, including and, the shield. And it's 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 totally different from White Mage, where it's just straight up like restoring HP, restoring HP. So again, more mind fuckery. So we have physic, and f- this is this is this is stigma that I carried over from Summoner, and I'm like, that's a useless spell. I'm going to put you way the fuck over here. So I totally forgot I had it. Not that it should have been something that I relied on during this battle, because it is not. Really, what you need to be doing is DPSing those de- those ads down. They don't have a ton of health. Like, two hits and they're done. And yeah, the first three times, well, two times, I did it completely wrong. And I was too focused on the um, peculiar Tonberry and then trying to keep alcohol alive. And that did not work. So yeah, this I is really good. Like I said, every single solo instance is great in this job quest it's an actual challenge yeah so what happens is that alka will rush up the stairs these ruined stairs to fight this tomberry in melee and they will stay stuck in the entire fight so you're good to go or so you think until these slimes will come out of the ruins and the slimes all have debuffs and also damage too and And they heal each other yeah you want to focus fire on the slimes and do direct damage like jen said they go down fast but if they don't go down fast, they will wreck Alka. Yeah. I was I almost got in the same trap as you, Jen. Like Alka got down to ten percent health for me until I realized what was going on. Yeah. I made the mistake of trying to think I could dot the ads and ignore them. Yep. But same. the damage they deal is too much to let it's them get much. ticked down. And by... then you're surrounded by like four of them. Yeah. And then another round comes in. And if you haven't dealt with the first one, well, yep. then you're super fucked. But it's really good because you have to focus ads. You have to heal Alka because he will get destroyed by the ads. And also they drop debuffs too. So he will get stuff like Vuln yep. ups and I think a dot as well, like a poison on him. Oh, disease is the third debuff. So yeah. you need to assume the debuffs, heal him, yeah. kill ads. You're going to get some Tom debuffs Barry. of your own as well. Yep. And um, yeah, man, it's just like, it's just uh, fundamentals. After a few times, maybe we clear the fight <laughs> and <clears throat> defeat the Tom Barry. I just want to say, I never went to very easy. I never went to easy or very easy. I kept Good it on normal. You, I'm like, I can, I can do it. Proud of you. I did it. Thank you. After we deplete the Tom Barry's health, it falls to the ground and Alka is about to rush up and to cleave it with his axe, except 
our fairy interposes herself between the Tomberry and Alka. Yeah. And he is shocked. In the confusion, the Tomberry scuttles away and disappears into the lake. Yep. After Alka this, is he is pissed the fuck off. Yeah. That's embarrassing. Why can't you control your fairy? He finally calms down a bit and admits, okay, so we're new to this. So maybe some, quote, disobedience is to be expected. I really hate the way he phrased that. Honestly, oh, bro, God, this fucking fairy does shit. whatever the fuck she wants to. And if we're lucky she heals us. <laughs> there, There's no control going on here. Yeah. Like, you, you know, learn to subjugate your bitch better was the, the message here. And he's like, well, I, I get that you, you and this bitch are new. So, uh, all right, I'll let it slide. I, you know, like, this is Jen's color, uh, by the way. It's yeah. not a direct quote. <laughs> I, and then, and then it it did it actually colored my interactions with with Elka a little bit after this, thinking like, is he a kind of a douchebag? He is not. He is not. Uh, he just is ignorant. He doesn't understand that the fairy is a person. He thinks it's a carbuncle. Right. Exactly. It's just some like magical pet. Back at the guild, though, he's calmed down a bit. He admits, actually, okay, so we have learned that the Marauder and Scholar Dream Team is successful. And also, the fairy remembered more from this encounter, too. So overall, mission successful. Yeah. Even though the Tomberry is not dead. Correct. Um, I, I'm, I appreciate the way Alka looked at the, the silver linings here. Like, what, what positive things can we pull out of this? Like, well, way to go. That's, that's, that's mature. Still not 100% on Alka, even after that exchange. I'm still side-eyeing him because of the disobedience crack. Anyway, the next time we meet up with him, he's, of course, done some more readings, and he has found details about Nimian Garb. Um, so this is the raiment quest to where we go and get our clothes. Um, but this is like about as solid and satisfying as the um, the the fucking what was it? Don't tell Summoner? me. Don't it? <sighs> yes, Summoner Quest. The Where twin I, to the scholar. <sighs> yeah, and I I was like, we just did that though. But yeah, where we uh, each uh, researcher at the dig site, like, oh look at that, I found some boots, and then this other guy way over there is like, oh I found a hat. So it seems very natural. This one this one also seemed pretty good. This makes sense. He's like, hey, I found these designs for this garb. I think he like reverse engineered sketches or something. Yes. From the the tablets. And then he makes these designs for us to go and give to the Weavers Guild in Ulda to have them recreate these traditional Nimian scholar garments. And he's hoping that if the fairy sees us wearing them, this will awaken more of our memories. Yeah. Very but cool. first, though, we have to grab some dire wart from Mordona, as this was the traditional dye of these garments. So we head to Mordona, go to the swamp, fight a few more bulls, grab the leaves, and then head over to Ulda. This was great because I uh, th- I was no longer synced to like you know level forty, <laughs> so I had all my level ninety power behind this, and I'm just like kabla kabla, and it was I needed that. I needed to feel powerful ruin their lives it was, it was really pretty effects too so this is i, I love this so off we go to ulda with our um with our designs you know our patterns or rather alka's patterns and uh, these materials and we hand them over and redolent rose is um well it's it's definitely a challenge right because these are fashion that hasn't been seen for centuries and centuries but he is very excited to be the one to revive these things He's like, you can watch, but it might take me a while. And I love this. I wish there was more of this, seeing the guild masters actually sit down and, you know, work. So you can see him with the patterns cut and laid out over the fabric. And he's, um, you know, cutting the pieces out. And But it's 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 cut, you know, and you don't get to see the whole process, obviously. Which is fine, I guess. And uh, he says, well, whew, gosh, I haven't worked that hard in a really long time. Here you go. Uh, I was only able to finish the culottes on my own. The other items need additional work. So you're going to need to go to um, Serenity. Is it Serendipity or Serenity? Serendipity, I think. We haven't done Goldsmith yet. It's, yeah, shit. I, I, I think I called her Serenity here. Maybe okay. you, I don't recall. You might be right. Anyway. It's one little sorry, girl. The um, Goldsmith Guildmaster. Correct. All right. Um, she's super cute. So we go over and she's like, oh, yeah, uh, let me whip this up for you real quick. 
And she throws a mithril tassel on our uh, mortarboard hat. Awesome. And then she's like, okay, so now you need to go see Jiva at the Leatherworkers Guild um, for these other things. And off we go to do that. And again, serendipity, serenity, uh, girlfriend, uh, is just so, she's also like really excited to be a part of this. She's like, oh my God, it's going to look so great. And we, we go to Jiva and give her the designs and she's, she's, well, a lot of the work has been done by Redolent Rose already and she's completely enamored with the quality of his work and she's just so excited to get into it. She, you know, working with something that is really quality is very, very satisfying. So, um, she's stoked. She makes us a pair of buffalo, uh, buffalo fingerless gloves. Yep. And uh, she's like, the boots are going to be done by my bro, Beli, over there. And because uh, he's just, he's a he's a damn good cord weaver. So he does a lot of like cobbling and shoemaking and shit like that. Uh, he is also super excited because Redolent Rose's um, initial work was so good. So now we have, we have gloves, we have a hat, we have culottes, and we have boots. This outfit is really, really cute. And I was so excited. Beli was also very excited. He's like, you should probably put all of this stuff on when you go see Elka again, because that'll make him just so happy. And I was like, well, obviously, you know, it's probably the requirement, right, to equip this shit. But I thought, oh, no, I'm just going to immediately make a glamour and I'll, I'll pull like one of my other gowns out and put them together and throw that on. And that way I can keep all my level 90 gear and spent all this time, found some dyes, found the perfect top, and I was so stoked with how I looked. And I go, and I'm like, Elka, what's up? And the quest is red. I'm like, fuck. So I click on him, I'm like, I bet I have to equip this shit, don't die. And he's like, hey, um, why don't you put that stuff on? <laughs> Can you not see it? Ugh. And he's like, I just want to make sure you didn't lose any of it. God damn it. So now I have to go back to the glamour dresser and remake the thing and i'm gonna just pff, yeah we f- i figured it out eventually but whatever there's no reason given as to why he didn't give us the chest pattern usually it's like the chest is missing or it's i'll give it to you when you earn it or whatever now just no mention of the chest piece here's everything else but chest yeah i should have walked up with everything and then just like a bra i guess <laughs> yeah hey hey I'll, I'll, uh what's his name alka Elka is, I think something's missing here, bro. Maybe a top. Where's the top? Did you make a pattern for a top? No? Okay. He never will. He never will. The set looks very good, though. It's very cute. He's just ecstatic. Besides the octagonal mortar board, the chest piece is a tunic. It's got a book bag over the shoulder, which is excellent looking. I have it on my character right now, but no cap. I think it looks good on a Lala to have the cap, but it looks a bit too absurd for other character races, <clears throat> in my opinion. <laughs> but even running around without the hat showing, it looks super fashionable. It does. Like, the boots are so cute. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. It's a very surprisingly kind of realistic detour where it takes the time to say, hey, you have to go to all these different tradespeople to make this thing fully. Yes, yeah. accurate, but also kind of a weird detail in this the otherwise of kind of the scholarly exactly um, yeah. yeah yeah i would guess that because they have to have every single artifact armor piece be a separate step in these quests this is how the scholar guy who i give props to decided to implement that yeah otherwise it was just going to be like oh look i found an ancient trunk with clothes that are still wearable inside yeah for some reason Meh. Meeting back up with, our, well, no, we're hanging out with Alka already because we sh- we're showing him our outfit. Yeah. And he's like, uh, you know, I've I've been reading about, you know, what the scholars' uh, contributions were um, to the military during times of war. But what were they doing during times of peace? Um, and it looks like, you know, they were basically performing charitable, charitable works of, um, like, healing the sick, taking care of wounded soldiers, and one account in particular details how the scholars were fighting against uh, the propagation of a virulent plague. Yikes, which we, we did go over that. And I didn't know the background information to this, so I didn't really make too much of this comment. I'm like, oh, that's cool. In the interest of trying to unlock um, more of Eos's memories, we go to Bronze Lake and there's a uh, warm wine uh, sanitarium there. 
And of course, Bronze Lake as a whole has, you know, like the, the natural hot springs. So it's definitely like a place of healing and recuperation. So off we go to offer our services. And I guess one of the administrators there, Rakusa Ferusa, asks that we go around and, you know, help with the toxins and the various maladies uh, that their p- uh, patients have. And I think we, we treat about five people. Yeah. They're, you know, like wounded I guess it's just a very generic term. They're they're affected or, or wounded uh, soldiers, all of them, uh, trying to deal with their shit. So, I, in short, we have uh, five people with a variety of needs. Uh, so we treat uh, shortness of breath, hangover, general weakness, muscle atrophy, and uh, delusions slash insomnia. Some of these, though, are caused by an actual ethereal imbalance. It's like old school medicine, but kind of real in this world. Yeah. Because as we cure them, their corrupted aether is actually expelled from the body and we have to fight it yeah. directly. So in the case of um, the guy with just general weakness, um, it was this corrupted ether that was preventing him from um, getting back into full strength. And then the the woman who was suffering from um, delusions and insomnia, same deal. There was this... this ick inside of her that was preventing her and this was a this is a callback if you ever had um visited a hot topic in the late 90s early 2000s you probably had a patch on a bag somewhere that said can't sleep clowns will eat me and so what she is muttering to herself over and over is can't sleep mummers will eat me can't sleep mummers will eat me i thought that was cute but we did it with that done we are now on to the final step here back at the marauders guild there has been another Tomberry sighting. They say that another Tomberry is out there. Apparently the whole guild or their scouts or whatever cannot tell that this Tomberry is wearing this mortar board and spectacles. It's very distinct, but they're just like, hey, another Tomberry is on the loose. Right. They all look like this, apparently. Incorrect, but whatever. I know. No, it's, it's, it's racist. <laughs> um, anyway, we, we return to Bronze Lake and meet up there with a few other marauders. They have gathered again at the same ruined heap of stone that we met this Tomberry at beforehand. It seems to be in a trance of some sort. It is a wash in dark energy. So we group up down below and make our approach collectively. And as we do, it sees us and calls out about the sun again, urging us to stay away. And then it jumps into the lake. Yep. So we give chase by boat. And now this capstone is super clever and impressive. This being in a base of Realm Reborn job quest blows my mind. <laughs> it's also one of the most mechanically difficult job finales, which are often just kind of yeah. button mashing snoozes. Yeah, it, it's just like an, an extension of the other uh, scuffles that we've yeah. had so far. But like this, this is an escalation. So we actually go into the Wanderer's Palace dungeon in the job quest. Yeah. We appear on the docks inside the palace. And then we enter the stone ruins of the the Wanderer's Palace, all overgrown, full of tomberries, all the good stuff. Yeah, it's it's the the exact intro to the Wanderer's Palace dungeon. It's just like a just a very very truncated version of it, but yeah. it's the exact same environment. It was, it was pretty pretty awesome. The Marauders apparently are so gung ho they rush ahead of us in the few seconds after we got off the boat. They obviously did not study Nimian tactics of the Scholar Marauder Dream Team, Rip. and they are paying for it. As they have already been cut down. They're not dead. They are wounded. Yeah. But they are down by Tonberry. Yeah. They uh, they underestimated the Tonberry. So we rush after them and we have to fight these Tonberries ourselves while these Marauders are down on the ground. And every Tonberry we kill, it releases a flame, like a, a floating flame that is called a Ranker Flame. This is very confusing at first. I wish these were not targetable because... It's hard They're to tell. They're invulnerable. Yeah. yeah. And then, it, yeah. <laughs> so pretty soon you're just going to have like a pile of actual targetable, hittable enemies and these um, flames of rancor that are invulnerable. It's kind of a mess. But yeah. yeah. And I tried to attack them, heal them, right click them, whatever, but nothing happens. Anyway, though, I left them alone, whatever. As we kill more Tomberries going deeper in, we accumulate more of these rancor flames And this will pay off, though, in a few minutes. So we press on and we find Alka already in combat with our quarry, the bespectacled Tomberry. And while we fight it, more Tomberries enter the fray. 
We kill them and we create more Rancor Flames as a result. Eventually, our quarry retreats deeper into the dungeon and we give chase. We find it by this indoor rectangular pool. And as we find it, it casts Everyone's Grudge. Everyone's Grudge is a signature ability of Tom Berry's in the Final Fantasy series. It deals damage proportionate to the number of enemies you've killed during the course of the game. This version of the ability triggers all of the floating rankers of the Tom Berries that we've killed so far to actually become aggressive. So when the grudge spell is cast, they go from floating around in the corridor to chasing us down. And when they touch us, they will explode for damage. Damn. So there are two ways to deal with this. You can either kite them around and spread the damage out. Or you can also shield yourself to mitigate some of the incoming damage as they all collide with you and explode. Yep. (laughs) I thought this was a super clever way to implement this ability in 14. It has the exact same spirit of the the ability in the series, but in a 14 lens. So good job again. Nice. And once we absorb the grudge, though, and we take out our quarry, Alka is again about to finish off the Tomberry, but Eos once again interposes herself between him and the Tomberry. Alka is just like, the fuck is wrong with you? Why are you protecting this demon? Again, he's ignorant. So we we get a little like, you know, wink wink from Eos and uh, we heal up the Tomberry. Then she basically Isunas him and removes the rancor from his body. And at last, he can actually, you know, he's, he's regained his faculties. He exclaims, Lily, my son. So Eos, her OG name was Lily. After we kind of bring him up to speed on uh, pff, civilization, um, he is shattered to learn that it's been 1,500 years and his civilization is no more. He says, I am, or rather, I was, uh, Cerrito Carito. And I was like, huh, that sounds like a Lala name. I don't know fuck shit about anything at this point. I know nothing about Tonberry lore or whatever. So I'm like, huh, okay. He, so he, my name is Cerrito Carito, and that's before the quote-unquote sickness of the sea transformed him. Then he just kind of gives us a little um, spiel about basically like, like the end of his like human consciousness essentially and he says it, it hit the traitors first their noses their ears their extremities would all melt away creating a more homogeneous uh, texture across their body their skin began to turn green and at this point i'm like no fucking way every tonberry i've ever seen used to be a person fuck and Okay, so that I needed to sit on that for a hot second. And while the traders were dealing with this malady, the scholars were furiously trying to treat them and to find a cure, which didn't happen. It gradually ex- it extended throughout the entire civilization, scholars included, and that's that's that. So, not only was their like their entire populace completely um like disfigured. Uh this Not the entire populace. Oh, just the ones that just the ones that lived in that area. The Wanderer's Palace was the quarantine zone for those who were sick, so that's why they flooded it was uh, to seal the sickness okay. inside the okay. palace. So there's a huge other part of the story that we're not going to talk about yet because it's in the Scholar Quest Part Two. Okay, but once we get there, it will shed so much light on this whole deal that makes sense because the so the the people i mean the the tremendous group of them that were um affected and transformed now they had to deal with the other nimians who weren't and gradually this this it, it was like sorrow and sympathy slowly making way to fear slowly making its way to anger and hatred and marginalization so that's when they they shuttered the Wanderer's Palace so nobody could get in or out, and they attempted to drown everyone inside. So living centuries and centuries with this disfigurement, knowing that there is no cure, knowing that the outside world completely misunderstands and despises you, that is where the rancor comes from. It's all of this gathered bitterness and hatred for the outsiders. 
And so it has consumed all of them. And Sorito? Yeah. Sorito was lucky enough that his former fairy could remove this from him. Jesus Christ. Also, we get a flash, an echo flashback as well. And we see Sorito Carito's former Lala self for a brief instant, him and Lily the fairy Ugh. in his original form yeah. before he was transformed. Yeah. Ugh. So sad. And during this whole retelling, we see the expressions from the marauders we're with. The pain and the angst and the terror and the horror is being reflected on their faces mm-hmm. during this retelling. Mm-hmm. After the story is done, we head back outside. The marauders leave to report back to the guild. They are still very befuddled by the experience. And we check in with Sarito again. Alka, he was he was less befuddled. He was just more horrified at what he almost did. Like, thank God Lily intervened because I would have killed a, like an innocent. Like, he's just, yeah, very remorseful. So then we check in with Sarito, who is back on his ruin mound. He tells us that he can no longer command scholarly magics. His Aether is no longer attuned to the crystal, I'm assuming, from the transformation. Yeah. So he officially bequeaths us with his former fairy and also teaches us more magic. We learn the sacred soil spell, which is the bubble. Yeah. He thanks us for helping him regain his senses and says he will not abandon his fellows. He returns to the palace to try to help them. The end for now. Oh, he also gives us our gown. Right. We get the chess piece. We haven't done the Gordania quests yet, but I think this is probably the best of the A Realm Reborn job quests. Wow. I know we've we've had some good ones, but yeah, this was... Yeah, no, basically I loved this. It became very intense, and then I learned the horrible, horrible truth of the Tonberry. And I feel like, one, how did I go my entire life without being spoiled on this? And two, is this known? People who have been playing Final Fantasy their entire lives, is this is this part of the like? Do people already know this? Is this when they when when this is revealed in this quest, are people are like, yeah, I know. No, okay. because this is where you find the Nimian Tomberry lore. It is crazy that this much game world lore is encapsulated in this fully optional content that people who are not either scholar players or completionists that want to do everything, they will never find it. Everybody should play scholar. Well, y'all just did because we spoiled it for you. (laughs) Yes and no. Yes, we talked about the story, but also experiencing it, seeing it for yourself is a different level of experience too. Yes. If you haven't done so, I'd recommend doing doing it. Maybe take a week or two off to let the memories fade a bit and have it be rediscovered. (laughs) But I, I think this whole thing is really well done from start to finish. Agreed. Next time, we are encountering the Ishgardians for the first time. We will be playing through the quest In the Eyes of Gods and Men. Well, that will do it for today's episode. Uh, Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, As always, we appreciate the fuck out of you. And if you want to reach out, please do. You can get us at uh, podreturnffxiv at gmail.com or via Twitter at podreturn. And we hope you enjoyed the episode and have a great day or night. We will see you next time.